Welcome animal lovers and welcome art lovers and welcome especially those of you interested in the theme of animals and art. Here we will explore the hidden meanings of certain icons of art history whose narratives comprise more than meets the eye. So if something catches your eye and you want to take a closer look, please hit that pause button because art reveals its secrets only to those who take the time to look. Part 1. Fruits and Veggies Giuseppe Archimboldo painted during a cultural movement called humanism, when humans pondered their role in nature and its inverse, nature's contribution to our humanity. Speaking of inverse, this is more than just a basket of fruit. Inverted upside down, this old man with a straw cap provides visual testimony to the maxim that you are what you eat. Before canning, freezing, refrigeration, and rapid transportation, people ate only the fruits and vegetables that were available locally and seasonally, such as those pictured here in this allegory of the four seasons, namely spring, summer, fall, and winter. Archimbaldo created a style of painting that we now call the Archimbaldo effect, which was an antecedent to the realism of the 20th century. Of a handful of his paintings that survive, his last is his masterpiece of duality and illusion. It is the original Mr. Potato Head, part two, fishing and hunting. Ever since prehistoric drawings on cave walls, art has been rich with imagery of animals. While most European and American paintings and prints depict cutesy storybook animals, some unwittingly portray our exploitation of them, and especially of them for food. In these examples from two portfolios of saltwater fishes, one is Hiroshige's of 20 fish, another is Albert Flamen's of 12. We can see here the marked contrast between the East's and the West's treatments of nature. Flamen's carps on the French or Flemish seashore are DOA while Hiroshige's carp off the coast of Tokyo is alive and swimming. Again, the dead mackerels of the West compared to the live mackerels of the East. And here, East meets West. Winslow Homer was a skillful draftsman who depicted commonplace scenes but from unique perspectives. Here we see two of his paintings of fishing from the viewpoint, not of the fishermen, but of the fish. More than the vast ocean separated Hiroshige from his American contemporary, John James Audubon. Audubon painted fish only in the clutches of predatory mammals or birds, such as this weak fish caught in the talons of an osprey. The osprey, along with all of Audubon's birds, is stiffened with rigor mortis because Audubon killed all his models in order to get them to sit still for him. Here, for example, are two whooping cranes, the second crane's position even more unnaturally contorted than the first. Audubon recorded in his journal that one flock was so dense that a single blast from his shotgun killed seven cranes. That would be equal to one-third of the entire population in the wild during the whooping crane's lowest count in 1941. No wonder that two portraits of the artist show him cradling a rifle, while none show him holding a pen or a brush. Another wildlife artist who shared Audubon's bloodlust was Arthur Tate, who shifted his focus entirely to the hunters. Stereotypically American, humans here dominate the landscape. While the ducks in the foreground are dead, the sitting ducks in the middle ground are fake decoys, and those flying high in the distant sky are beyond the range of the guns. But wait, these two ducks flew in from the next painting. Winslow Homer again. Now you might be wondering, didn't that numbskull narrator just say that Homer was a skillful draftsman? Yet, does not this contorted duck on the right look as dead as a dodo in an Audubon painting? Ah, answers this narrator. That is precisely Homer's point because he depicts duck hunting from the viewpoint not of the hunters, but of the ducks. The two duck hunters are afloat 
on a distant boat mostly hidden by the choppy waves. To the left of the limp legs of the left-hand duck, you can pick out the red flare from the hunter's shotgun blast. This is a very accurate depiction of the true toll from duck hunting. Aimed at a flock, the buckshot hit two golden-eyed ducks. The one on the right was killed and is plummeting headlong into the sea. The one on the left was only crippled, hence his limp legs. In fact, nearly half of all ducks hit by buckshot escape crippled and die, never to be retrieved by the hunter. Part 3. Carnality and Iconography From the boat rocking on turbulent waters, next we will venture onto the rocky terrain of Christian iconography. Peter Ertzen's heart shook things up a bit, but not because of the body count. This scene is an accurate depiction of an outdoor meat market in 16th century Antwerp, but it is nearly as accurate of one today. This larger photo shows a butcher shop in London during the hippie 60s. These three inset photos record an outdoor meat market in Spain in sedate 2018. You can almost hear the flies buzzing. Even today in Europe, not all meat is shrink-wrapped in cellophane and served on styrofoam. Ertzen's many depictions of butcher shops did not shock his contemporaries. It only surprised them. Same as in 1962, when Andy Warhol painted his first Campbell's soup can, no one was shocked, just surprised, surprised to see one in between picture frames and exhibited on a gallery wall. Be assured that I am not magically pulling this painting out of my hat. It is studied in every art history survey course and is documented in every survey textbook, as shown here in the two most recent editions of Janssen, the seventh with a no longer surprising Warhol on the cover. The butcher's stall marks a transition from religious painting to secular and from portraiture to still life painting. An emerging economic class of rich merchants could newly afford to decorate their walls with paintings. In 1551, the date of this painting, Antwerp had become the second most populous city of Europe and flourished at the center of commerce in just one or two generations, Antwerp's population had doubled in size, and its appetite for meat increased nearly twofold as well. Yet, a fixed number of butchers, 62, served them all, a number legislated into law by the powerful Butchers Guild. Consequently, butchers were among Antwerp's richest merchants. Ertzen and his workshop painted four identical butcher stalls, so we know that three other butchers kept up with the Joneses by identically decorating their living room walls, if not their dining rooms. Freed from dictates by both the church and the state, Ertzen turned conventions topsy-turvy. He pulled dead lumps of flesh into the foreground, made the one man in the middle ground no bigger than a sausage, and relegated the painting's two religious scenes to the background, outlined here in red. We'll return later to religious scene on the right. This more predominant religious scene on the left depicts the flight into Egypt, when Mary and the Christ child fled the imminent slaughter by Herod's army of all of Bethlehem's infants. Two halves from completed painting, what the artist puts in and what the viewer takes out. Thus, we can reasonably conjure in an artwork's reflections of our own time and mindset that the artist never anticipated. The background could be commentary on the foreground. Note the ironic juxtaposition of the flight into Egypt with, in the foreground, the biblical scene that follows, the slaughter of the innocents. The Christ child was led out of danger. These innocent farm animals, however, were led into danger. The man portrayed here is probably the pious nobleman who commissioned Ertzen to return to a more obvious religious scene, this of Christ in the house of Martha and Mary, which shows Martha berating Christ for leaving her to prepare their meal on her own, while her sister Mary, instead of helping, listens to Christ sermonizing 
Two, beware the perils of the pleasures of the flesh. He advises that we should be more concerned about our spiritual health than our physical needs, as represented by the meal. By flesh, he meant carnal desires. Yet, we know that flesh is synonymous also with meat. In German, for instance, Fleisch means meat more than sex. As for carnal, in Spanish, as in Chile con carne, carne means meat more than lust. In this painting, Ertzen disorients the viewer and turns the religious scene on its head. Despite its religious title, the religious scene is again relegated to the background where it is contrasted with materialism, gluttony, and extravagance in the foreground. In Christian iconography, most of these items symbolize something more than meets the eye. The lilies and the roses symbolize Mary. Not even vegetables are excluded from being branded by iconography. For instance, the lowly cabbage symbolizes luxury and sensuality. Christ sermonizes, Ertzen moralizes. The religious opposes the secular, the spiritual versus the mundane, the polemical in contrast to the pictorial. One more meat painting by Ertzen and I will spare you the rest. Some with more meat per square inch of canvas than even his butcher's stall. This one with relatively little meat is called Allegory of Carnis Voluptus, canonical Latin for Beware the Perils of the Pleasures of the Flesh. On the left, a bowery the tavern scene of two couples making merry while boozing it up. On the right, an owl symbolizing wisdom, watching over a family scene of a righteous couple and their son. Front and center, dividing the two lifestyles, hangs a lump of flesh. Meat was not Ayrton's only marketplace subjects. His less moralizing paintings, meanwhile, were selling like hotcakes. Onward to Ayrton's nephew and star pupil. Joachim Berkeleer. Berkeleer's butcher's shop on the left, Ertzen's butcher's stall on the right. You can see the pupil assimilated many of the same elements. A, the flayed and halved pig. B, the pig's head. C, the pig's knuckles. D, the vat of fat. E, the cow's head. And F, the tray of sausages. But there's something missing. Berkeleer dispensed with religion altogether. Instead, in the background, a tavern scene of an amorous couple fooling around. Here, Berkeleer took Uncle Ertzen one step further, or one step backwards. This fish market hangs in the Worcester Art Museum, which I visit twice a year, and where it gives me endless pleasure. The painting was recently restored and cleaned, but no amount of conservation work can cleanse it of its sexual innuendo. I call your attention to the fishmonger with his exploratory middle finger hooked inside a salmon steak, and with a twinkle in his eye. If your eye wanders elsewhere, you're on your own with that. Market scenes became so popular that the genre spread elsewhere in Europe, but it culminates with Berkeleyer's The Four Elements, Earth, Water, Air, and Fire all logically paired with four marketplaces with life-size vendors and miniaturized biblical scenes in their backgrounds. The vegetable market is earth. The fish market is water. The poultry market is air. The meat market is fire. As I had threatened, we now return to examine Ertzen's biblical scene to the right in the background of the meat stall. Question, where's the biblical scene here? Answer, where there's the beef? Slaughtered and flayed oxen and swine became a popular motif in painting, mainly because they symbolized the crucifix. I assure you, this is Christian iconography, not vegetarian blasphemy. Rembrandt painted and etched many scenes of the raising of the cross. In this one, we see Rembrandt in the beret while he not only has painted the crucifix, but he has plotted it. And we see here what he's saying when he painted carcasses. Of his two paintings of a slaughtered ox, 
This more famous one hangs in the Louvre. Rembrandt uncovers the strange, subtle beauty in what the uninformed eye might consider an inappropriate subject of painting. His intentions may be more than aesthetic. They may also be ethical. He portrays the unquiet flesh of an, un, of an animal outraged by the butcher's knife and abuse the ox with the same pathos he evokes in his portraits of living people. As frequent visitors to the Louvre, Daumier and Chaim Sotin both greatly admired Rembrandt's slaughtered ox. The closest Daumier came to painting a carcass is of this butcher filleting one. But Sotin painted several that owe their inspiration to Rembrandt. Sotin later confided to a friend a childhood memory. Quote, I saw the village butcher slice the neck of a bird. I wanted to cry out, but in vain. When I painted the beef carcass, it was still this cry that I wanted to liberate. I have still not succeeded. Bartolomeo Passarotti owes his style to Erzen and Berkeley. Inspired when Passarotti viewed them in the villas of a rich merchant and a rich banker, both who returned to Italy with those Flemish artworks from their, for their collections after conducting commerce in Antwerp. Passarotti painted the butcher shop, combining in the butcher on the right realism with irony and humor with satire. If we can imagine some actor other than Lon Chani or Benicio del Toro in their starring roles, this is our Wolfman. Was he driven mad by his occupation? Or, because he was already depraved, was he driven to his occupation? The painting reflects a popular notion of its time. Bartolomeo Pisanelli's treatise on the nature of food and drink was published two years before this painting. In it, Pisanelli ascribes red meat as an intemperate food that produces foul-smelling excrement, that is to say, stinky poop, and is so difficult to digest that it is suitable only for laborers. As depicted here, the butcher on the right is such a laborer. But wait, it gets better. Or gets worse. This butcher shop is a companion piece, piece to a second painting titled The Merry Company. Beneath the mirth and merry lurk deeper aspects of pain and pity. The gentlemanly butcher on the left who grins at us is based upon a self-portrait where the artist wields a pen rather than a knife. The boar's head is modeled on his sketch of a demon, and the hunk of animal flesh that the wolfman grasps in the first painting turns into a hunk of human flesh, manifesting good old carnis voluptus. Part 4. Peter Bruegel the Elder, who belongs in the category all his own. Another pair of companion pieces is titled The Rich Kitchen and the Poor Kitchen, or The Fat Kitchen and the Thin Kitchen, or The Affluent Kitchen and the Impoverished Kitchen, or The Opulent Kitchen and the Meager Kitchen. The titles are inscribed below the print in three different languages, none of them English, hence the varying translations. We'll mix it up and call him fat and poor. In the fat kitchen, all the fat slobs are stuffing their faces, mostly on fatted pigs. Even the cat and dogs and infant are obese. In the poor kitchen, the cupboard is bare, the kettles are empty, and the emaciated peasants remind us who are well-fed of the liberation photos of survivors of Dachau. In the fat kitchen, an emaciated bagpiper who had tried to gain entrance is being shoved out the door. In the poor kitchen, one of the fat slobs is trying to flee while the very same bagpiper is pulling him indoors. The interaction between the fat slob and the emaciated bagpiper closely resembles a painting and its study by Jean-Francois Millet, where the pig resists being dragged to the chopping block. There's a darker gloom than the creepiness on the surface of the fat and poor kitchens. These two kitchen scenes beg the question, do humans eat animals to prevent themselves from eating each other? 
Less immediately chilling to consider are the ecological land use equations exemplified by these two engravings. You've read the numbers, though they vary, that vegans may require only one acre of farmland per year to feed themselves, lacto-vegetarians around five acres, and meat-eaters 25. Meaning, if the planet's entire population were vegan, there would be plenty of plant-based food to go around, therefore less need for farmland, and therefore more wilderness and more wildlife. But only if. Meanwhile, big fish eat little fish. Among the parables and proverbs illustrated here are two veiled critiques conceived by Bruegel to protest religious and military oppression. This is not how fish were hung to dry in Bruegel's era. This is how heretics were condemned to hang by the church. This is not how fishermen were dressed during Bruegel's time. This is how soldiers were armored and helmeted for battle. And here, a father instructs his son on the ways of the world, as if he were saying, big fish kill small fish, small people kill big and small fish, and big people kill big fish, small fish, small people, and when they eat far too many big and small fish, they kill themselves. Part 5. Calves Milk The veal that floats invisibly in every glass of milk. Winslow Homer again. The male human is fondling a female cow's mammary gland, but his wandering eye is on a female of his own species, whose own mammary gland he probably wishes he were really fondling, fondling. Winslow Homer yet again. The titles of the preparatory study and the painting both are The Unruly Calf. The calf looks as uncooperative as the pig being dragged to slaughter in the Mie painting. But slaughter does not await this calf for another four months. So why is he not budging? Because the painting is a preparatory painting for yet another painting whose title is Weaning the Calf. In the foreground, the black child is clad in rags and he labors, while the two white children dressed in clean clothes look on, looking like overseers, shading this painting's meaning with racial overtones in its post-slavery era. In the background, to the left, two colossal mounds of hay echoing a huge pair of mammary glands. And in the background to the right, a man is dragging away the calf's mother so that he can rob the calf of its mother's milk and can send the calf on its four-month-long path to become veal. Years ago, I worked on a family-owned dairy farm in upstate New York. The loving family treated their cows like family members, but they knew the doom to which they condemned their calves. Though they ate cow meat and, of course, drank calves' milk, they steadfastly refused to eat veal. If I were to drink the milk of a species other than my own, that lactating female would have to be a goddess. And in fact, Queen Hatshepsut of ancient Egypt is depicted drinking from the udder of no less a goddess than Hathor the cow, the cow goddess of love and motherhood, and protectress of women. But somehow, her job description neglects to list her as protectress of female cows and their male calves. Part 6. The Ark. We're almost there. The end is near. Les Grimes was a laid-off Hollywood set design painter who went looking for a job and created one painting Hog Heaven. His outdoor mural in Los Angeles wraps around two city blocks of the facades of Farmer John Slaughterhouse and Meatpacking Plant. Grimes painted it for 11 years until he fell to his death from scaffolding while reaching high to paint clouds in the sky. A master of illusion and humor, he painted pigs trying to escape out of pens, out of fake windows, and even out of real windows. This is another painter's own version of one of Les Grimes' wall murals, complete with a wino passed out on the sidewalk in front of the wall. This is actually a detail of what Les Grimes did not depict. 
the unseen horror of what goes on behind those walls. This is a page from Sue Coe's book, Dead Meat, a portfolio of her paintings and sketches of slaughterhouses throughout North America, along with her essays about her visit to each site. These are the covers of four of our five books. While the fifth image here, Porcopolis, is actually a frontispiece to our article published in an art magazine, not an animal rights magazine. A highly regarded artist represented by a prestigious Manhattan gallery, Suko devotes and donates much of our artwork to support animal rights causes. Modern man followed by the ghosts of his meat. Auschwitz begins whenever someone looks at a slaughterhouse and thinks they are only animals. Hell is reserved not only for humans in purgatory, but also for farm animals in the living hell of factory farms and the dying hell of slaughterhouses. The Nobel laureate for literature, Isaac Besheva Singer, wrote, In their behavior toward creatures, all men are Nazis. Sukho would agree that in their treatment of farm animals, all men are devils. Her Ark The inscription on the bottom reads, In 10 years, the average American consumes 144 fish, 185 chickens, 8 turkeys, 7 pigs, 1 lamb, and 2 cows. That was in 1990 when this print was made. 30 years later, Americans probably now consume fewer pigs and cows, but more fish and chickens. But fish and chickens are much smaller than pigs and cows, so the total number of animals that disappear down the mouth of Martin Moloch is greater now than ever before. In contrast to the mouth of Moloch is the entrance to the Ark. This is one of the few historic paintings of Noah and the Ark that highlights the animals rather than the Ark which here is barely discernible way in the distance. Usually, as here, the arc predominates because it's so much easier to paint. And usually, as here, the animals are mostly farm animals. The American primitive Edward Hicks painted proportionally more wild than farm animals, possibly because compared to Europe in the 19th century, America still had many wild animals left to model for him to paint. Of his nearly 100 peaceable kingdoms, this may be the most well-known. They all illustrate a verse from the vegetarian prophet Isaiah. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. The background shows the pacifist, Quaker, William Penn, making a peace treaty with the Indians. While he does not sit in peace with the lamb, the kid, and the ox, yet we will never make peace with other humans until we make peace with animals. In the words of Bugs Bunny and Porky Pig, that's all, folks. <laughs>